So that's essentially what happened. I mean, heretical Jews in, in Babylon who instead of of seeing the exile as a sign from God and, and an encouragement for them to reform their ways, they instead choose to amalgamate their paganism to a to their interpretation of or they disguise their amalgamation of their of this paganism as an interpretation of the Bible, which eventually gets called Kabbalah. But it's essentially the ancient worship of the dying God and the mystery uh, practices that are involved with it. Now, if I understand correctly, right. the belief in Mithras incorporates the idea of a messiah, which would be very appealing yes. to the Jews in exile because they sought after a king who would come and conquer and restore them to Palestine and build the temple again. Right. And obviously, there's a lot of cross influence there. Do you so believe... Do you believe that messianic ideas are a part of Kabbalah from, from way well, back? I mean, I mean, I think messianic ideas are just part of human history. So, I, and I don't think they're exclusive to Judaism or Christianity or Islam. So, I, I believe they they would have rightfully emerged in Zoroastrianism as well. But like in every other faith, it gets misappropriated and used for other. You know, I mean, the idea of a Messiah is just being misappropriated by the Kabbalah for its own devious purposes. So we have the Jews in exile in Babylon, we have Persia as an emerging influence, and we right. have the Jews entering into an apostasy of the cult of Mithras. Right. And this is the emergence of Kabbalah. This is That's the right. soup that brews Kabbalah. It is the Kabbalah, yeah. In fact, there's Daniel himself is supposed to be one of the wise men. I'll just say that from early on, there wasn't a perceived contradiction in belonging to the wise men of Babylon and remaining within the Jewish faith. So you do not so, believe that Moses had a Kabbalah or that a no, Kabbalah no. was presented at Sinai? Absolutely not. Okay. And that's an important distinction. Yes. <laughs> this, this, that's the great myth. That's the great lie. Moses was a true prophet and the Kabbalah is the ultimate heresy. The key point is at this time in history, the world, except for presumably the Babylonians, were pretty much unaware of the Jewish people or of their distinction from other uh, races or cultures. Because even Herodotus, in the mid fifth century BC, when he is in Palestine, he describes uh, as circumcising themselves. Uh, he believes that they are remnants of an Egyptian colony, which obviously refers to the Exodus, but he doesn't call them Jews. He doesn't refer otherwise to a different faith or Moses. He just calls them Phoenicians and pretty much characterizes them as indistinguishable from the people of, of that coast. And there were also other things that were in common with the Jews, if I remember correctly. They buried their dead, which was uncommon practice at that time. The right. priests were clean-shaven and... Um, practice cleanliness rituals right. and other yeah. things that Herodotus identified but he never specified that there were any tribes he never mentioned Judah and this was used against the Jews about the time of Christ to say that they had fabricated their history and fabricated their religion and Josephus goes into those issues right. in his book against Apion right and in fact the point of the point of the the Jews being identified with Phoenicians is very significant because there have been a series of studies recently, primarily by Walter Burkert, who is considered one of the leading scholars in the area, and M.L. West as well. They're reconsidering the role of Phoenician influence in the emergence of Greek society. And it's obvious that the two were intertwined. And the funny thing is that this was mentioned by the early historians as well. Of course, the, the alphabet has always been known to have been derived from from the Phoenicians. So essentially, the word alphabet comes from you know what's close to the Hebrew. This so is uh, this is not controversial. This is very well known history. Very well described. known. It's very well known. The common Greek brought to uh, it was brought to Greece by Cadmus, whose father was Phoenix from Phoenicia. So there's no yeah, you know, like you said, there's no controversy there, and more particularly. There is one historian named Hecateus of Abdera in, I believe, the 3rd century BC, 
or forth, he said that uh, there was a colony of Jews, Egyptian colony, when they left Egypt, some of them settled in Palestine under a leader named Moses, and but the rest, or a number of them, kept going and went all the way into Greece, and they came to be known as Cadmus and Danaus. And this is the famous myth in uh, the, the myth of origin among the Greeks about Danaus as being one of the, the early settlers of, um, of Greece and having derived from, from Egypt. This, this is stuff I get into in more detail in my book. Maybe we don't have to get into it. It's getting a lot of topic. But it's just to say that from very early on, from at least the 8th century BC, there's, our, uh, there's already a strong correlation between Greek culture and Jewish culture, or Israel in a sense. That Greek culture already, from inception, seems to have emerged out of a great degree of, of uh, Jewish influence. Why would you say that there was such animosity between the Greeks and the Jews and the Maccabeans and Antiochus in that period, and why would they view it as Hellenization to adopt Greek culture if there was a commonality between the two? Or are you saying that it was an influence among some Greeks who then became prominent philosophers and identified as being Greeks, but Hellenic society itself had its own identity? I mean, the all, like I said, the all, the Greek alphabet was essentially Hebrew, or derived from Hebrew. And yes, it did also influence elites, but the, the influence of Hellenism really didn't come until Alexander, so that was much later. You know, I guess it was kind of the, the overt paganism of Greek culture, which was difficult to accommodate, despite the fact that it was being practiced esoterically anyway. Do you believe there was an alliance of Persians and Jews, and if so, why were the Persians enemy of, enemies of the Greeks but friends of the Jews? I don't know. <laughs> just, as, just as mysterious as the many supposed alliances or enmities that uh, exist in our time, I think so. I'm just wondering what you view as the political alliances between the Hellens and the Jews at that period, at the period of the exile. But I guess Cyrus was kind of viewed as a bit of a savior, right? And he's the one who... Yes, who absolutely. Was, uh, who released the Jews from captivity. Then there also you have the very important case of Esther, who was the one who appealed to the Persian king to... Uh, Slaughter Haman and his followers. Exactly. Now, and then, so she marries the Persian king. And this, this is actually a point that gets into my next book. Over today. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's tie this back to what constitutes the Greeks. So the key point is that Greek philosophy emerged in Ionia, which is on the western coast of Turkey, then under Persian occupation. And the Magi had already spread to that part, not the orthodox Zoroastrianism, but the heretical form. In fact, there's probably the greatest scholar of the last century was a, was a Belgian named Frank Cumont. And, you know, unlike the scholars in our time tend to specialize in a certain field, so we have scholars who specialize in Greek civilization, and a few who might specialize in some, Eastern, some ancient Eastern civilization. But there's very few who who specialized in ancient culture in general, which is what he did. So he had a particular perspective on the situation uh, that others have missed. And and I think that others, most scholars are too lazy to investigate it thoroughly. And like I said, because they, they don't see any Zoroastrian influence specific, they tend to, to deny his theories on the whole. But what he pointed out was that, in fact, it was heretics and he calls them Madrusians. And he said that it was the Madrusians who spread across Turkey. And instead of practicing Zoroastrianism, they practiced this mixed cult of Babylonian magic, and you know, including astrology and things like that. And it was these, with these Madrusians, that the Greeks came into contact with. So when you look at the ideas of the pre-Socratics, it's obvious that they were influenced by the Magi, because their first, all their first issues have to do with the rotation of the planets, with the four elements, uh, pantheism, and things of that nature. All Are you discussing Pythagoras and others? All of them. All of them, including Heraclitus. But it also, and there's, there's something else that scholars missed, is that there was claims that the Magi used to practice mystery rites. And again, there's no mystery rites in Zoroastrianism. So you're saying the harmony of the spheres and all the other ideas that entered into Greek thought came, 
are Kabbalistic and relate to, to, the, ma to the influence of the Magi. I see. Now, I'm not saying that there wasn't some degree of, you know, modification, but I believe that the prominent philosophers, particularly Pythagoras and Plato, weren't just influenced by Kabbalah, they were actually the great exponents of Kabbalah. So, just as much as Isaac Luria would be considered a, uh, an innovator in the Kabbalah, uh, Plato and Pythagoras would have been as well. So, what? they're within the tradition, they're not just influenced by it. Now, Kabbalah can be viewed as a history, it can be viewed as a set of prophecies, it can be viewed as a method of thought, it can be viewed as a political approach, and all of these elements, these diverse elements, you find in congruence with the thought that the Greeks produced. Is that correct? You know, when people say they're interested in Kabbalah, I never understand why, because I can't imagine what aspects they could be interested in. I mean, what, if you read the Zohar, it's an immense book with all kinds of multivariate speculations. So what, what aspect is it that they find inspiring? I, it's so huge, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense. But, so that's not what I'm looking at. I'm looking at the original core ideas that are the foundation of the Kabbalah. And those you will find in the mystery schools and in Merkava mysticism. And it's a few basic ideas. They're usually based on the idea of, um, of a dying god, essentially, a, a, a death and rebirth ritual, ascension through the planets towards union with this god. And you and find that in congruence with the Greeks. Can, oh, can you yes. specify certain Greeks, for example, Plato and his Republic, and Timaeus, and Critias, right. and how it is Kabbalah-like? We have to... To, to create a commonality of elements to support your thesis. Right. So the first thing we have to go back to is, as I said, the Magi used to practice mystery rites dedicated to Mithras. These, when these were appropriated by the Greeks, they came to be known as the mysteries of Dionysus. And the evidence for this is Heraclitus, who said so himself in the 5th century BC, who said that the rites of Dionysus, that is the, the phallic rites, were dedicated to uh, Pluto, which is the devil, and Dionysus, which is, which is the same, and that they were in imitation of the Magi. So it's clear. There is no doubt about it. And there, there is actually a piece of archaeological evidence that was also discovered dating from approximately the same time that repeats the same claim that the Dionysic mysteries were in imitation of the Magian mysteries. So you're focusing on the occult beliefs, the religious philosophy, and the ritual practices. Right, because the mysteries of Adonis became the basis of the cult of Orphism, or of Orpheus. And interestingly, Orpheus was, what's the connection? Is he the son of Museus? And numerous ancient authors claim that Museus was Moses. So already way back, at least is going as far back as the third century BC. There's an idea of Orpheus as being of Jewish origin. So the great exponent of Orphism was Pythagoras. And the leading student of Pythagoras was Plato. And uh, the Catalytic influence in Plato is most obvious, at least, like, as you mentioned, in the Timaeus. The Timaeus mentions uh, refers to the god as being one of three, uh, an offspring and a spouse, which is basically just the ancient pagan trinity. And this As also relates to Pythagoras and Aristotle, the idea that three is a divine number and... Presumably, presumably, yeah, because, well, yes, I think so. And it's fundamental, wherever you find the cult tradition, you'll find that the divine god is part of a trinity. It's a key concept. Not only that, but Plato asserted that man is part of a trinity, that he has uh, urges. Freud plagiarized Plato's work with the right. id, the ego, and the superego. Right. That, again, it relates to the dialectical method of thesis, antithesis, and synthesis.